Welcome to worship, everyone. My name is Pastor Matt from Wesley United Methodist Church. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this time of worship together. Whew, Christmas, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day are past us. Uh, there's still probably a few things on our calendar that are going on with, with connecting with family, whether it's uh, distance or whether it's in person, and some of our uh, final celebrations at the end of this year, ringing in 2021. But before we do that, it's important for us to stop and pause and settle ourselves, to not look at what we have going on the rest of the day or the rest of this week, but let's settle this time and invite the Holy Spirit in prayer to fall upon us and to honor what's going on today. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Almighty God, thank you for the gift of today. Thank you for the gift of your presence. And Lord, we are so aware of the power of the Holy Spirit that we just invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to fall amongst us uh, in this place, however we are gathering, that you would fill us and you would surround us, you would sustain us and, get, and lead us to where we need to go. Lord, we ask that you would take joy and be glorified in all that's said and done in this time of worship. In your Son, Jesus' name we pray. shared, but the awesome love of God still shines brightly in our hearts. Our spirits resound with the good news of salvation. God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Dear God, we confess we are not ready to come down from the Christmas high. So, time was spent, so much time was spent in preparation, but somehow right after Christmas Day we feel a letdown. We don't want that high to be over. We want to feel the peace on earth feeling, but we let it go. We push it aside when we begin our journey of complaining and blaming others for everything that's going wrong. We ignore the blessing of the gift when we refuse to help those in need. Shake us up, Lord. Get us ready to be people of compassion and hope. Wake us up, Lord. Help us see the beauty and possibilities of peace around us. Fill us up, Lord. Fill us to overflowing with joy. Let our words, our thoughts, and our actions speak of your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you could join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is coming from the Gospel account according to Luke. And we're going to further down from where we went last time we got together. This is Luke chapter 2. It's going to be verses 22 through 40. And I'm reading from the NIV. So I'd like to invite you along to Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for the purification rites that are required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him before the Lord. It is written that the firstborn male of every family is to be consecrated back to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said also in the law of the Lord, that a pair of doves or two young pigeons are to be offered. Verse 25. So there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was with him and fell upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, Simeon went to the temple courts when the family was there. And when the parents finally brought the child Jesus before him, which was a custom of the law, Simeon took the boy in his arms and praised God, saying these words, Sovereign Lord, just as you have promised, you will not dismiss your servant in peace until I have seen with my eyes the glory of your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and to the glory of your people, Israel. Verse 33. The child's father and mother marveled at all that was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, these words, This child is destined to cause the falling and the risings of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken out against, so that the thoughts and so that the thoughts of many hearts will finally be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Verse thirty-six. There was also a prophet named Anna. She was very old, and she lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was eighty-four. She never left the temple, but worshipped day and night, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were leaning, looking forward to the redemption of Israel, or I'm sorry, the, the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything that was required by the law of the Lord, they returned back home to Galilee in the town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Man, I feel like I need a drink of water. That was a long set of, set of scripture, but there's a lot there to unpack. Before we do take a look at these few verses, I want to ask you this question that I hope would prevail us during this time together today. When you see God's work in your life, or you view God's work in the lives of humanity, do you view that work of God as an intrusion or as a divine interruption? Now, those might seem like in the same block and wheelhouse, but let's pull that back a little bit. Because if you see the work of God in our lives, in the lives of humanity, as an intrusion, that's defined as wrongfully entering upon. So it has a negative connotation, not welcome. We don't welcome intrusions. We're not happy about intrusions. We often don't respond well to intrusions. But 
what about a divine interruption? What about a divine presence that brings power and hope and glory? And an interruption that is defined as breaking a path or stopping a line, stopping progress or con continuing something. You see, divine interruption is something where God interrupts our lives for something, some purpose, some reason. And I want for you to think of that for a moment. Because as we are closing the book on the year 2020, I think all of us will be a little excited if we can finally do that. But as we're marching toward that for a moment, it feels like we have had nothing but intrusions on our life. The ones that are unwelcome. The ones that, that don't seem to be for our own good. But I don't want us to confuse the intrusions upon our lives with divine interruptions that come directly from God. You see, because divine interruption is one of those moments where, yeah, our, our situation gets kind of messed with, our, our boat gets rocked a little bit, but sometimes it's to gather our attention because God is about to do something or in the midst of doing something or is, or is about to use us or in the midst of using us. All those situations that we bring upon ourselves in these moments brings us to this moment of Scripture because Mary, as we learned about Mary's song and her response to the angels when we were talking about the divine birth, and so is Joseph, it wasn't so much an intrusion as understanding this was an interruption in their lives on behalf of God. So embracing that divine uh, interruption, we now pick up to this opportunity where Joseph and Mary are joined with Jesus and they are faithfully responding to the, the law, to the religious rites that they had of being Orthodox and faithful Jews. And so they traveled to the temple, which was required to fulfill these things. They were to present Jesus before God. Now, there's a couple things that are going on here because at the beginning, we see that they went to Jerusalem, right, which was their area, uh, to present uh, Jesus to the Lord because it is said that every firstborn male is consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping the law of the Lord. Now, this says there's two doves or two pigeons. Now, to dust off a little bit of our Old Testament knowledge, it was written in those laws of Moses or the law of the Lord that when you were presenting a newborn into the temple, you were also supposed to ask for a sacrifice for anointing to God, for God to bless that. A sacrifice to God was supposed to be a lamb. However, lambs were also costly, which is the reason for the actual sacrifice. But everybody couldn't economically afford those things. So as we understand from the law, that now when you're on a low economic rung, sort of the poorest of the poor, you would offer two doves or turtle doves or pigeons. And so we see that not only was Jesus' arrival literally out of the womb, his birth, being offered in a manger in, in an economically low status, but we also see his, even his presentation to God, right, the Father, was also wrapped in economic distress or poor. And so it's important to understand that they were still being very faithful to the law of Moses. And so they were also going to this time um, when they would have a... Um, a consolation that was here from Simeon was the high priest there who was going to be coming out, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And I wanted us to take just a quick time out before we move further here. I know I'm probably talking fast, but it's because the power of the Holy Spirit is such an exciting thing. And oftentimes, you don't hear a whole lot about the Holy Spirit in the middle. We hear a lot about it in the birth narrative from Luke, and then we don't hear a whole lot about it until Acts, because it's the same author. Well, what Luke is trying to establish is that the Holy Spirit is work all the time. He's sort of shining a light on it to say, see that, see that, see that, see that, see that. He wants us to understand these great divine miraculous things that the Holy Spirit is given credit for, is capable of. So when we are living in the midst of the Holy Spirit, we know that that kind of power is residing with and around us. And so Luke is pointing to the power of the Holy Spirit falling on Simeon because Simeon was prophesied to not die until he met Jesus as a child. And so when Jesus was presented here, he was named and he was circumcised eight days after he was born. And so when we see this law picking up, we can see that Simeon says some words when he uh, is called by the Holy Spirit to go out to the, the courtyard. And he says, my eyes have seen your salvation. You see, because Simeon was testifying to the power of the Holy Spirit because he was in mourning of longing for the salvation of the people. And he was also longing for not only Israel, the chosen people, to be saved, but also was wondering, when is everybody else getting in? And so we can see here, it says, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, to the glory of the people of Israel, and to you, God. 
And so we see that Simeon is very aware, because of the influence of the Holy Spirit, that this is the child that he was waiting for. His life was extended so that he would be able to see this day. And so he's proclaiming this glory, and he's proclaiming and preaching this salvation and offering peace. Now, before we move any further, I also want us to remember the power of Luke's writing here is to influence a certain group of people, right? Well, this is also a time when we're looking at Rome that Caesar, remember we talked about that Caesar was being heralded as a savior as well, as a bringer of peace through uh, military might. And so on one end, uh, the, the heathens or the unfaithful, you know, uh, were, were praising Caesar for being the chosen one, for being the savior, for being the prince of, prince of peace. And yet here in this poor place to not the Roman Empire, but to God's chosen people is a poor Small in stature, savior of the world and true prince of peace. Wasn't just a savior of Rome, the savior of all humankind. And so we see another great uh, highlight of Luke's here is that Luke often is the only gospel account that really elevates the, the role and participation that women have had in the, in the gospel story. And so that's a valuable thing because we're looking for identities to see that God continually uses women throughout scripture. And Luke is sort of pausing there for it to get highlighted, if you will, right? He's highlighting our Bible from some of these uh, powerful, influential females in the life of, of the narrative story here. So we also have that after Simeon says his bit, and he gives this, this words to Mary about what will happen. Jesus will reveal hearts of many, and she will also be pierced by a, soul of sad, a sword of sadness. But also Anna. And it's important here because we get some information about Anna, but it sort of feels out of place if we don't know where we're going with this. Verse 36 says, Anna was very old. She lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. Why is that important? Well, if we pull that apart a little bit, what it's saying is that she never left the temple. She worshiped day and night, fasting and praying. Being dedicated to the temple, being a widow, and fasting and praying was often a sign of mourning or sorrow. And it surely wouldn't have lasted as long as she was around. It would have lasted for a season, and then they would have left the temple. What this is establishing is that Anna was something different. Yes, she was a widow. So people of that day would understand, well, of course she was there fasting and praying because she was a widow. Luke is quick to tell us that Anna is a prophet. She is there because while she is a widow, she was only married for seven years. So most of her life, she was there at the temple. She was fasting and praying. But it wasn't because she was mourning her husband. It was because she was mourning the captivity of the Israel people in Jerusalem. She was praying and fasting to God. Her sorrow didn't come from the passing of her husband, but her long life saw that she was wailing in her soul for the redemption of Jerusalem. And so now we see that Jesus is lifted up, one by the prophet or by the by the um, the temple leader Simeon for salvation and glory to God through Jesus. And now we see this woman prophet, prophetess, I guess you could say, is she came out having this whole life of prayer and fasting and temple service, and she will come out to say, glory has come, the redemption of Israel. And so we see these two people lavishing all these things and gathering attention, and it's meant for the people there to see something special is going on, but it's also something for us to see what's going on. Because friends, I want us to see when we ask what now, if we look at Christmas as being a holy celebration of Jesus' birth and arrival into our world, as a divine interruption of God into the wholeness of humanity, what does that mean for us? You see, we're looking historically at something that happened in our past, but how does that frame our future? What do we do with that information now that maybe our Christmas tree doesn't have any presents under it? Maybe some of our decorations are even down. That it is beginning to feel a lot not like Christmas as the 25th has come and gone. Friends, when we celebrate Christmas, the arrival of Jesus, the birth of Jesus into our world, this fulfilling of scripture and salvation and redemption, the, the celebration of Christmas should bring about a celebration through all human history that brings an abundance of joy, an overwhelming joy in our lives as people of faith. That the present circum certain circumstances that surround us right now, the world that we're living in, the 
you know, constant pressure of our health and wellness. The celebration of Christmas should be so vast and so huge that it doesn't allow our present circumstances to overwhelm us, to overshadow the celebration of what Christmas means, or to really diminish in any way the work of God in our lives in that moment and today. The light of the world shines upon us. John puts before us, the light of the world has been born to us to chase away the darkness. Friends, as we look to close out the year of 2020, putting it behind us and moving forward, the question is, what now? What do we do with this message of hope? What do we do about this great arrival for, for salvation and for redemption? How do, we, how do we honor that in our lives now that Christmas is over? I think the important thing is that we don't forget that we don't put the arrival of Christ in celebration of Christmas, that we don't put that way back in a box, in a big tote that's marked Christmas, that's going to gather dust until next year. We're reminded that God's plan, God's divine interruption in the history of humanity was the arrival of his son. As we go forward from this place, we sing our last few songs and we go about our week soon. Let us remember that God is still at work in our lives. Let us be faithful in responding that way and saying, yes, God, we will follow you. We will listen to your commands and we will embrace Jesus. Just as the people heard Simeon and Anna say, glory to God for the gift of this child.
gifts, tithes, and offerings. We just thank you for your generosity as we close to the year end. Um, we'd ask that you would be able to uh, find a way to get your gifts to the church if you want them included in your year end giving, uh, whether it's by mail or, or, or going online. Friends, we are so thankful for God and all God's provision that we are called to faithfully respond as giving to God what is God's. And that's our first fruits of blessings that we've already received. So please join me in a moment of prayer as we ask God to honor and bless this time in our offering. Almighty God, you know our situations, you know our gifts, you know our tithes, you know our responsibilities and our faithfulness. And we ask, Lord, that you would, you would honor our faithfulness as we give back to you as you've commanded us to, to give of what you've already given us. Lord, multiply these resources and these gifts to provide hope and to provide light into this world so that others will come to know you, so that you will help us sustain the spirit of Christmas as we start and approach our beginning of 2021. Lord, we give you all the glory and praise for your matchless name. In Jesus we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Friends, our benediction is sending forth as our last time gathering this calendar year is that when you flip the calendar over soon and it becomes to be New Year's Day, January 1st of 2021, there are new possibilities in a new year. Although they might not necessarily look different because it won't feel like a whole lot has changed. But it's up to us to allow this time in our history, in Wesley's history, for us to embrace the Christ child and to understand that he came to redeem and save us, but not just us, all the world. Let us be standard bearers and message bearers of this great hope so that we can carry one another's cross and support one another as we go into this year of 2021 because we're tired, we're fatigued, we're a little sore, but together we can do so much more. We can support, hold accountable, and encourage each other. So let us go forward to do work that is beyond our own capability. Let us rely solely on the work and the majesty and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us go not in our own power, Lord, but that of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.